right, Ben. Uh, we've covered a lot of area here. Now we're going to go to the master bus and talk a little bit about that. We'll start at the top, and uh, it's the, all the usual things, your conventions. You've got uh, the name and the ability to add plugins. You follow my mouse down. And then we get down to here. This is where it gets different from all the other strips. What is this? That is the left and right phase correlation meter, or... or um yeah, it's a phase correlation meter. What that means is it's telling you how in phase your signal is or how mono compatible your signal is. So it's it's important for your track to be mono compatible because you never know how somebody's going to listen to this. Yeah. And if the bar is sort of to the right and 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 green, then you know it's it's very mono compatible. If it's all the way to the right and sort of in that yellow area, then you know it's almost purely a mono signal. If it's purely to the left and red, then you know it's uh, a very out-of-phase, mono-incompatible signal. And if it's sort of in the middle or to the right of the middle, then it's a nice, spacious, uh, you know, mix. I suspect that if you roll, you're going to see that your initial mix is is very mono. It's going to be kind of to the far right of the meter. All right, well, let's, and, let's, have, a, let's have a listen. Okay. So what are we looking at here? You could see that it went over into the yellow there. Well, you're seeing that your mix uh, is very right, and that's and it's but it's, there is some green there too. It's not it's not a tiny thin line on the far right. It has some it's a block with some green in it. That's yeah. a very mono compatible mix, and because what you've sent is just some stereo wave files that you've already mixed. Yeah. Uh, it indicates that you made a nice very mono mono compatible signal. Now I suspect that if you turned on the reverb. Uh, now, you'll probably get a little bit wider signal because the reverb will put some out of phase information into the left and right channels. Let's just see if, if that happens. All right. Yep. Quite different. Yeah, quite different. So that was a good guess on my part. Yes, very good. Uh, <laughs> so now that that kind of sound is very spacious, but not very mono compatible because you, so it got sort of thin. We actually draw the line sort of thin. So a good mix will be will be greenish and and on the right side of that meter. Now, of course, we always use our ears, not our eyes. But isn't it nice to to have verification that what you're hearing, you know, if you're flying on an airplane and listening on headphones or something, it's nice to be able to see that your mix is going to be monocompatible as well as hear that it's going to be monocompatible. So now, who who came up with this? Is this is this what's in your analog um, console? Actually, that's a feature of our digital broadcast consoles. Okay. Uh, there were some analog consoles, and in fact, there were some Harrison consoles that had phase meters built into them. Uh, there, but they weren't really common parts of the analog mixing world. But they're such an important part of to today's digital world that we decided that would, that's a really useful tool to add, even though it's sort of outside the realm of you know analog music mixing from the 70s. Uh, again, it's very visual to so simple and very visual so you can look at those things at a glance and see exactly what's going on. Right. Yeah. All right, well, let's move down to the uh, the meter here. There's a meter right here. It's called a K14. I can see that. Master Average Levels. Right. This probably des deserves an entire uh, video discussion, but I'll try to move quickly through it. The the Your mix should have adequate volume level. I think we can all agree with that. You know, if, if you're going to be played alongside other tracks on an iPod, you're going to be played alongside other songs on the radio, you're going to be, you know, you're going to be compared to other songs. So your level needs to be nice and loud. Historically, for the, for the last few years, people have really looked at the digital peak meters in their DAW to determine how loud this track is, and that's that doesn't give you very much information because a digital peak can be very high. For example, these transients that we talked about earlier, but the perceived volume can still be pretty low. So an averaging meter shows you how loud the system uh, sound the song is likely to sound, and um, it also helps give you an idea of how dynamically compressed your song is. So a digitally mastered and mixed song is is typically going to be it's going to be peaking at zero. It's going to be peaking at the loudest available volume 
of your system all the time. Now the question is how loud does that actually sound? So the K14 meter is scaled so that if it's pointed straight up, the average level is 14 dB down from full scale. And that's a nice so, loud level that you might have found in a lot of 70s and 80s or 70s recordings, we'll say, uh, before the loudness wars took hold. The, uh, the, the loudness wars, I like that. Yeah. yeah. So uh, a much more common level these days would be to the far right of that meter where it's just slammed. Okay. But we're trying to give some scale. To, we're trying to, to, uh, to help people find that correct level that gives you a nice loud sound, but not over compressed. So the K14 meter, if it's pointed straight up, means you have 14 dB of headroom. If you want to go louder for a very spa uh, or quieter rather for a, a, a more spacious jazz type thing, it might you might want to shoot for the minus four side to the left, which gives you a little more headroom, a little bit it's quieter signal, but more dynamics. Um, if you, on the other hand, if you want to go for a more aggressive rock type tone, you might go to the plus four side, which indicates uh, only 10 dB of headroom. And then if you really want to go for the over compressed heavy metal, you know, a gr loud aggressive music, then you'll push all the way into the red on the far side of that meter. All right. But uh, so again, we could talk a long time about those concepts, but that meter gives you an idea of how loud your track is going to be. Well, we can, uh, again, we should do a full section on this because obviously the where when, how how you get there is important, and the interactivity of uh, compression and volume levels coming off the individual tracks going into the buses, and the buses going into the master bus, all those things, and the balance of how you get there is going to make a big difference to the sound too, right? Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, that deserves a full section, and we'll we'll pass on that and uh, move down to the. Um, the area here that this we've got the same kind of stuff you've got the name of the the master you've got mute uh you have a what appears to be an input trim level well it's telling right. me that right um and then you've got a, again a compressor and uh now is this compressor this output compressor different it appears to be the same it is the same except for one subtle difference the the threshold covers a much smaller range so when you grab that threshold and move it, um, it doesn't go as low as the other threshold controls do. And that's because in your final mix, you're trying to compress those, you know, last half or one or two or three dBs instead of doing dramatic compression like you were doing in the, in the earlier stages. So it's a more, it's, it's scaled to be a little bit more subtle for that final mix. All right. Well, that, we will cover more detail in that in the a compressor tutorial. Um, you know, basically explaining to people the interaction between the compressors on the individual tracks, the buses, and again, the master, because that does also require, I think, a full tutorial there. That'll be great. Yeah. Well, Chris, we, we did skip over two two things, and I won't take long talking about them, but there, underneath the K14 meter, there, is, there are some tone controls. Yes. And they are similar to the mix bus tone controls, but they're even more subtle. They only go plus or minus 6 dB, so you have a very fine control of this final tone shaping of your mix yeah. and they have different center frequencies you'll notice that there's one that's low and that's really low frequencies and then there's one called low mid which is the uh, a, a band that um, can get a little too much energy in the lower mid range and make the mix sound tubby so it's nice to have a place where you can bring that down by one or two db and then you have a high, which is, these are more about the extremes. That low and the high are more extreme settings than they were on the, on the uh, mix bus tone control. So all of the, the different EQs are, sh are, are center, uh, their center frequencies and their shapes are set to be sensible for the, the job you're doing at that stage. And then, yes, I noticed you were just pointing at the limiter. Yes. So there's a final limiter, if, and uh, you, the green light turns the limiter on and off, and there's a yellow light next to it, which turns the look ahead on and off. The look ahead is a function that allows the limiter to listen to the audio and adjust the level uh, before you hear it, so that it's actually listening to the audio a little bit before you hear it, and it can begin bringing the level down a little bit if there's a loud transient coming. Okay before the transient comes so it makes it more transparent and uh, less intrusive of a limiter sound but that does incur some delay so you normally leave that off when you're tracking when you're recording 
and in your final mix you turn on that yellow light so that you can use the limiter to its in, in its best sounding uh, now would you mode. have would you have this limiter on or off during tracking well I always leave that limiter on because it's a safety limiter it's it's at the final output right before it goes out to your speakers and it's not really intended as an artistic tool it sounds good it's very transparent it's it's not what you normally would use a limiter plug-in for it's uh, it's it's just a very transparent limiter that keeps your signal from going over and distorting the output of your sound card. Yes. Uh, and because that's really what it's for, it has a very obvious metering function to show you when you're hitting a limiter. If you'll roll, roll the sound a little bit, you'll see a yellow bar appear. Now maybe bring the, bring the master fader up a little bit so that we hit the mirror. Okay, I see it. Yeah, right here. Right where the mouse is, right there. That's where it comes in. And that's where the limiter starts to really work, okay? Right, and so that gives you a big indication that, wow, you're you're at a level that normally would go over zero dBFS, and we're catching that and bringing it down for you. So with modern music, like with, uh, with rap and stuff like that, where it's booming, would they be slamming that right up into that area? Is well... That Probably not, because this limiter is is very transparent, as I said, yeah. and it doesn't give you that squashy sound. It, it'll just it, it's like bringing a fader down. It's riding a fader down, and making your mix quieter. So it's not giving you that loud, edgy sound. It's just saving you from clipping at your output to your sound card. So uh, in my experience, I tend to just barely kiss that limiter occasionally. I'll just see the a little bit of yellow appear, and that's that's the more common way. If you see a lot of it, it's because you've set up your gain staging wrong earlier, and that's a big, bright yellow indicator that, hey, you probably aren't doing what you think you're doing. It's like having a second, really sensible engineer watching over you. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> or a mom. <laughs> 